Hi, my name is Brandon Grazley. I'm a high school computer science teacher. We have been working on this space shooter game for quite a while now, and today we are going to add some enemy movement, a sort of very simple artificial intelligence for the enemy. He starts right here in the center and never moves, so he's pretty easy to hit. So we're going to randomize the direction that he's moving in and change that periodically. So that's the plan for today. We're going to be working in three different classes, the space shooter game class, which we haven't touched since the very beginning, the game screen class, we'll do a bunch of work there, and also the enemy ship class. So because I want to generate some random numbers both in the game screen class and the enemy ship class, I want to have a random number generator that is available throughout my application. So here's how you make a random number generator. It's, it's random. Um, but to make it available everywhere, we're going to make it public. And I'm also going to make it static, which means that anything that wants to use this object can do so without having a reference to this specific space shooter game object. All you have to know is the name of the class, so you'll say space shooter game dot random, and that's how we'll use this. Okay, let's go to the game screen class. We'll have a few changes to make in the game screen class. Let's go down to the render method. Okay, and right here we have this detect input. We also are going to need to move our enemies at that time. So I'm going to make a new method, move enemies. You'll notice I'm calling it enemies, even though we only have one. In the next video, we're going to add in multiple enemies. So this way I won't have to rename it. So it needs to know how much time has passed so that it knows how much how far to move things. I'm going to go and put this down underneath the detect input method. So private void move enemies, and it gets a float, which I'll call delta time. So it's going to be really similar to the touch input or detect input method. Um, in fact, I'm going to kind of copy and paste some of this stuff. I'm going to copy this first chunk with our strategy and these limits. We also need limits for the enemies so they don't move off screen. So I'm going to copy and paste that to begin with, and then I'll start editing this right now. So find the maximum distance the ship can move, and then we're not going to use this. Instead, we will um, determine the direction it's moving using a vector, which we'll get to in a moment. So the left limit, instead of the player ship's bounding box, is going to be the enemy ship bounding box. The down limit, now it was how far are we away from the bottom of the screen. That's going to have to change because we don't want the ship to go past the halfway point of the world. So let's see, if we take the world height and divide it by 2, so that's going to be um, half of the screen height. If we from that subtract the enemy ship's bounding box, y value, so that's the bottom left-hand corner, the y value, which you're going to no notice is going to be above world height divided by 2. So because this number will be smaller than this one, we're going to end up with a negative value here, which is what we want. The right limit is going to be really similar to the player ship, except it's going to be the enemy ship and the enemy ship. And vertically, what's the upper limit? Well, if I take the world height, don't divide it by 2, and subtract the enemy ship's bounding box y value um, and also the height. We want the height of the enemy ship to be excluded as well. Okay, this is all quite similar to the player limits, um, but we're trying to stay in the top half of the screen and we're using the enemy ship instead of the player ship. I'm just going to add one thing here. Instead of uh, integer division of the world height over 2, I'm going to make that a float. I wonder if I did that up above. I did, so let's change that to a float as well. So casting world height to float, and now that's floating point division. It's not a big deal, but it's a better practice to divide floats. So we get floats. So we know how far we're allowed to move. Let's go back and look at how we did move. Now, we're going to be using something more similar to the touch version of this. So I'm going to copy and paste all this stuff here. That's the part where we actually moved the ship. And then we're going to make some changes to what's in here. So this part is going to change here. Uh, all the rest of this is the same. And we're also going to use the enemy ship movement speed instead. I'm going to, oops, enemy ship movement speed. I'm going to do that right now. Enemy ship movement speed. And last it's going to be enemy ship dot translate. Okay, so now all of that's all the same except 
how do we decide which direction we're moving? This part was determined based on where the user was touching the screen. But now we're going to have to decide where the ship is, should move based on something else. So that will happen inside of the enemy ship class. So this is going to change. It will refer to something in the enemy ship class. So we're going to go and do some work there and then we'll come back and fix game screen. So the enemy ship will need to keep track of a little bit of information. Um, we're going to need a vector 2, which I think we've dealt with before. We're going to call it the direction vector. Uh, we're going to need, let's see, a float that keeps track of the time since last, I'm going to call it time since last direction change. And I'm going to initialize that right now, start that at zero. And I'm also going to need another float. I'm going to call it direction change frequency, I guess, which is going to be, I'm going to start at 0.75. That needs to be a floating point number. This is every three quarters of a second the ship is going to move, uh, change directions, I'm sorry. So let's go and initialize this direction vector variable down here in the constructor. So right after we call the supers constructor, so in here this is where we want to uh, initialize the direction vector equals new vector2. Now I can, I'm going to give it a direction here. So it's a two-dimensional direct, uh, direction vector. So the x direction, I want to not be moving in the x direction. And I want to be moving totally downwards in the y direction. So directly towards the player. So that's the initial heading for this vector. Uh, then we're going to need some methods to work on. So one of the methods is going to be um, a getter for that. Let me just do it this way. Right click, generate a getter for the direction vector. There we go. Oops, I don't need a setter, so let's get rid of that. So that's a public method, all set and ready to go. We'll be using that in the game screen class. Uh, the other one we're going to need is a another one method to Actually, I'm going to make this one private, void, randomize direction vector. So the reason it's private is because this is going to be called from within the uh, update method, which we have to override for the enemy ship. So every once in a while, we're going to need to call this method. How often? That's what this variable up here is going to be for. OK, let's get into it. So a direction vector is just two coordinates and we want those numbers to be between 0 and 1 and in particular we want them to work out so that uh, the vector itself has a length of 1. So we're going to use a little bit of trigonometry, not too too much. So I'm going to use a double, which I'm going to call a bearing. So straight up would be bearing 0 and as you move around uh, clockwise to the right that's where the bearing changes. Um, so to calculate a new bearing, I'm going to use that space shooter game random object that we had talked about before. And from it, I want to get a, a new double. So this was going to give me a number between 0 and 1. Now, when we do trig in Java, it works in the radian measurement system, so not degrees. So normally, if I was using degrees, I would do something like times 360. This would give me a number between 0 and 360 because the double is between 0 and 1. But I don't really want to go to 360 because that's degrees. Instead, we're using radians, and so I want to do like 2 times pi. Now, I could do this, but why make this calculation over and over and over again? That's kind of unnecessary, and I really don't need that kind of accuracy. So I'm just going to type the number in. Uh, 6.283185 is super accurate enough. So this is 0 to 2 times pi. That's what we're going to get for a bearing. Okay, so now we want to adjust the direction vectors x and y values. So the direction vectors x value is going to become equal to, I'm going to turn it into a float, math dot sine of the bearing. So trust me, sine is going to give us the x direction. And then for the y direction, we're going to use cosine. Now, if you've never done anything like this before, maybe just don't worry about it for now. So we now have a new bearing with a uh, length, if you want the vector as a length of 1 or magnitude of 1. Uh, so the other thing we need to do is 
we need to have this method be called at an appropriate time, so every so often. So to do that, we're going to need to override an existing method. So generate uh, override methods. And the one we want to override is the update method. Currently, nothing really happens in the update method. So I'm going to call the super method, although I don't recall whether anything really important happens. Maybe the I think the laser information updates in there for all kinds of ships. Um, but this is going to be special for the enemy ship because the player ship doesn't need to have its direction vector randomized, right? So instead, we're going to basically check and see has enough time passed that it's an appropriate time to to uh, change directions. So our variables that we need are these two, time since last direction change and direction change frequency. So time since last direction change is going to be equal to the current value plus delta time. So that's plus equals, meaning it adds on delta time to the direction change. And we need an if statement. If the time since the last direction change is greater than uh, the direction change frequency, so for example, direction change frequency is uh, 0.75 seconds. So if time since last direction change is more than 0.75 seconds, then it's time to do a direction change. A randomized direction vector. Also, we need to adjust the time since last direction change. We need to subtract from it uh, the uh, direction change frequency. So subtract that 0.75 seconds so that we uh, don't just constantly do this over and over again. Okay, now it's time to head back to the game screen class and um, use this get direction vector to help us out. So for the player ship, we took the touch difference and divided it by the overall touch distance in the correct direction. And this would give us the sort of proportional amount. Now we're going to make a change here. And to do this, I want to say enemy ship dot get direction vector. And, oh, it's not coming up. I, I know why. I'm just going to scroll up to the very top of this. Now, the reason is that the enemy ship is not currently the right type. So we're going to go way up here, way up to where we declared it. See there, we just used a generic ship, which was the superclass, but I, I specifically need that to be an enemy ship. I need to know that it's an enemy ship, and I guess I can call this a player ship right now. That way I can call that method, because that method is unique to the enemy ship type. Uh, let me scroll way back down. There we go. Now that's not an error. So that we get the direction vector. <laughs> Different error though. And I want the X part of that. Same thing for the Y component, we call it. The Y component of the movement multiplied by the movement speed times the delta time. Now you might be wondering, what about that update method? When do we call that? Well, let me go back here. Way up in the render method, we had enemy ship dot update, and because I overrode the original update method, now that new part is being called. It's also still calling the old part because of the super call. Let me just load that up for you. In the ship class, uh, it is the time since the last shot that's in there, and it's common to both the enemy ship and the player ship because it's part of the ship class. Okay, time to run this. Okay, well maybe you can tell our ship is moving, not very quickly, so we're going to make a couple more changes in the game screen class to make the game a little bit better. So from the top of the game screen class, scroll down until we the place where we made the enemy ship. Its movement speed was 2, that's not very good. Let's make it something better. Well, we can make it as fast as the player ship, that should be fine. There's one more thing I'd like to do. At the moment, we have the center, uh, the X and the Y center of the ship being declared right here, which puts it sort of smack dab in the middle of the top half of the screen. And I think I would like to randomize that. So let's do that at the same time while we're working on this here. So we're going to change these two values so that they're randomized instead. So the center, I need to do that space shooter game dot random dot. Now this one time I'm going to do a float specifically because I don't have to do trig with it. I'll, I'll use a float because that's the kind I want. So I'm going to pick a floating point number and we're going to multiply it by um, how wide could this be. So I'm going to do uh, world width. I'm going to make a small adjustment. I'm going to take away 10 from it. That's the width of the ship. And then I'm going to add 5. 
the end. So the center will be at least five from the left and at least five from the right because of that. Um, now for the y value, we want to take the world height and we're going to subtract five, which is the height of the ship. Oops, not a semicolon, comma, there we go. That'll be the height of the ship. So basically I'm trying to make it so that it can be anywhere on the very top row of the, sh of the screen. Okay. Time to run. Okay, so you weren't able to see the very beginning because of uh, how this loads, but the enemy ship is choosing a random direction vector every three quarters of a second. And I noticed that sometimes it gets kind of stuck on the edges where it maybe sits there for a little while. That's because the random direction vector, when it gets to an edge, it's got a 50-50 chance of pointing in kind of the same direction again. So you could be a little bit smarter about choosing the direction vector. For example, if the ship is way over on the left-hand side, if the x value of its bounding box is zero, then you want to make sure that the um, x direction is positive. And same with the opposite side, you want to choose the, uh, the uh, a negative x value. So you could just flip those, for example. So a couple of if statements, and you can make sure that the ship is always moving somewhere good. Okay, so that is all for this time. Next time, we are going to move on to making multiple enemies, and they will all move randomly. So it'll look, uh, it'll look pretty cool. Thanks.